Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today, we're talking about all things AI with author Orly LaBelle. She is the author of a few books, including her newest, The Quality Machine, Harnessing Digital Technology for a Brighter, More Inclusive Future. She is a Warren Distinguished Professor at University of San Diego, and she's a former Israeli military data analyst and Supreme Court clerk. She regularly consults governments and industry on law and technology. Today, we're talking about AI, technology, automation, and customer experience, broader society, and so much more. Please enjoy Orly LaBelle. Orly, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. Are you in San Diego today at school? I am. I'm in my office at University of San Diego. It's a beautiful day and the heat wave is starting to lessen and it's starting right. to be more like Yeah, Diego I'm in LA. Weather. So I, yeah. yeah, it's, it felt a little more like fall yesterday. So grateful. And it even rained this weekend. So, um, so Cal, yeah, we're, we're getting some relief from the heat wave. Um, so, I mean, you have a really fascinating background. You served in the military in Israel. I assume you were born in Israel, but for our audience that don't know your background, can you just talk about, uh, you know, how you got started and starting like with the military experience? Yeah, I would love to. So, yeah, I have a, an unusual background for a Californian, San Diego, you know, law professor an author because I am Israeli. Now I'm naturalized. I have a dual citizenship, but I was born and raised in Israel and I went to the army when I was 18. So this is before university. We go to the army, right. men and women. And I served in the military intelligence and actually in my new book, The Equality Machine, I describe how that was a formative part of thinking about data analysis and automation and digital technology and the good that it can bring and the dynamics that it, you know, how it shapes dynamics in markets and in uh, organizations. So I, I served in the Army and after my military service I went to study in the Sorbonne actually in Paris for um, almost a year. I did uh, some kind of general education with the knowledge that I'm going to go back to Israel for my first law degree at Tel Aviv University. I clerked on the Israeli Supreme Court, and then I traveled to Cambridge, Massachusetts for uh, two graduate degrees at uh, Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School of Government, uh, where I was a doctoral fellow. So that was already launching my academic career. and. Um, you know, kind of becoming a, a researcher and a policy consultant and a law professor. So in your book, The Equality Machine, you talk a little bit about your experience in the military and how even at that point you were using data and AI to help create equality among men and women in the military. So was that the starting point of this interest in how technology can be used to help push equality forward? I think it really was. I didn't think about it in the terms that I think about it these days. I, it was, I was kind of living through that moment where, you know, we were getting more comfortable with personal computers and with um, intranet. Um, it really wasn't the internet yet. It was the intranet, which of course was invented by the military, both in the, you know, the American and Israeli uh, military units uh, around the world. Um, and I saw, you know, one of the things that I saw, which was really formative, was that when I was serving in the army, it was very gender unequal. So women couldn't go into combat. They couldn't become uh, fighter pilots like my husband. So I met my husband in the army, and he is an F-16 pilot. So at that point, it was really, there was this kind of sexist slogan of, like, the good men to the Air Force, the good women to the pilots, you know, dating the pilots. 
because um, we weren't admitted to um, combat and, you know, kind of these elite um, frontline positions. But really the only place that we could be in a more gender equal position was in the military intelligence. And I was selected to a very elite um, unit within the intelligence community. And it really kind of opened up, you know, suddenly when you, when really your tools are knowledge, te digital technology, communications, interactions, processing of a lot of different sources and resources and making sense of things, then suddenly you know, your physicality is less important, uh, your gender is less important, and it, uh, it has kind of that democ democratization, the you know, kind of great equalizer quality of technology in, in our interactions. So we have to step back. When we think about business, Orly, there is a lot of talk about inherent bias and so many of the decisions coming out of the Silicon Valley, they impact so many people who are making those decisions. What is the inherent bias in the technology? What do we need to be aware of with AI? Can you just talk about some of the challenges that we're facing now just as a society with the growth of AI? Sure. So AI is really affecting every single aspect of our life. And in, my, in my, my book that's coming out in October, it's uh, really kind of this broad investigation of every aspect of our, from our intimate relations like dating and our um, family lives and our romantic and care, you know, personal care, um, interactions with AI, all the way to markets and financial services and consumer services and credit and um, and and of course employment and you know how AI is affecting hiring and performance evaluation and pay. Um, so every aspect we we know this. I think there's kind of that sense that. It's, it's happening rapidly, it's changing who we are, how we exchange, uh, how we know, how we um, manage our health and our um, relationship, our consumption. And yet there's a lot of fear and irrationalities around um, you know, what it's doing. And uh, some of it, are rational fears, uh, most certainly. So you mentioned bias, you know, there's, there is this overarching fear that uh, AI and algorithmic decision making will be biased and has been biased in various contexts. And in the equality machine, I, I work through that, I really kind of investigate, when is that true? When can we trust AI? Um, and then even more than that, I argue that we need to step beyond just the debiasing, you know, making sure that it's unbiased, but really looking at its potential to create more equality and more inclusion and uh, more diversity in different settings when we really direct the, the program, the, um, the algorithm in ways that fit our values. So a lot of the people listening and watching this podcast, they're business people, they're interested in customer experience. They run customer loyalty programs, customer service. What are some of the challenges for big business when we think of automation and AI? So there's so much to think about and I'm really fascinated by you know, the whole field. So I actually collaborate with um, a lot of marketing professors and consumer behavior and judgment and decision making um, scholars. So uh, I write in this field of behavioral policy and you know how do we think about customer service. I also uh, am an academic consultant to a major um, publicly traded platform, online platform that thinks about customer service and content moderation 
and how to get it right with um, the products, the, the exchanges. So I think about all of these aspects a lot. And I think um, with automation, again, there's kind of the, the risks. You know, there's the things that we have to think about in the risk bucket of what can go wrong, what we need to avoid. But also there's a lot of promise and opportunity that needs to be leveraged. Um, and yeah, I mean, Blake, tell me what you, you think. You know, what, what, what are you seeing as some of those risks and opportunities? Well, obviously, for people that are processing a lot of customers through one experience, when the experience is not personalized, that's a problem. If the experience is too personalized, that can be a problem because then customers don't feel comfortable. Like, well, what is my being data? What is my data being used for? There's so much dysfunction in customer service. We know that because many of our listeners and viewers have had a terrible customer service experience in the last few days. So I think technology gone wrong, wrong used too much when we actually need a person or um, technology when it's put to good use can really help just with stress of people, of individuals. So that, that's really my lens. So what is the right balance? And that seems to be like what a lot of people are struggling with in business, the balance of technology and human. Yeah, no, that's a great um, framing to think about it. And I actually think about privacy a lot. I have uh, also scholarly work um, that I, looks into this question of, you know, what do we really value as consumers uh, in terms of privacy? And, you know, as behavioralists, we, we see a lot of empirical research about the paradox of privacy, where there is like a lot of this overarching fear of, as you said, that we don't want to give up too much personal data, personal information. We think that there is this um, diminishing privacy in the market. But at the same time, we do want the personalization. We do want the customization, the kind of the tailoring of services uh, that, that will fit our preferences and our needs. And it turns out that empirically, people are quite comfortable giving up a lot of their privacy if they feel like they're going to get a benefit from it. Um, and even more than that, uh, I show in the equality machine that a lot of times when we are overprotective of personal information, we're actually hurting the people who are less on the radar of consumer um, kind of marketing, a consumer service um, professionals, because there, there are people, there are communities that are more on the edge of data. Mm -hmm. So they haven't been in the system as much, either because they have less access or they are by definition a minority. And if we're not collecting more information about them, we really won't be able to cater to some of their needs or check for biases that we're not, you know, um, just, you know, having this one um, paradigmatic idea of what our customer looks like and needs and, and feels and, and mm -hmm. wants. Um, so I think that even with the data collection, there should be a balance on, on that front. And I, I look a lot, I mean, in a lot of contexts, I look at how do we do that balance in a way that is really serving us and serving our normative values without creating the risks of you know, misuse of information. So actually I've been arguing that we need to think more about um, appropriate use versus misuse rather than to collect or not to collect, you know, to know or not to know. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I think is a good way to reframe sometimes the, mm -hmm. these questions of, you know, are, are we intruding on, on people's personal information when we're trying to customize our product or our service? Mm -hmm. The other thing is when you say, you know, I, I heard you kind of saying, well, there are things that the bots will do better, like mm -hmm. they alleviate, you know, so much of the burdens. Um, there's just, in, in a lot of contexts, there's just, it's too much to expect um, 
you know, a human, like with the platform that I work with, you know, there's millions of sales going on every month, a lot of exchanges and data. Um, and if you want to do, for example, for example, re responsible content moderation, you will have to have some automation in this. Um, it's just not humanly possible to go through, you know, just all of this scale of data and, and make sure that um, exchanges are appropriate or... Um, when we think about AI and technology, I wouldn't say that many of us think that the government is really on the forefront. It's usually business on the forefront. And then the government is like the last body to learn about these technologies. Is the government currently involved in the regulation of AI or do they have even much of a say of how business and industry are creating these technologies? Such a great question. I actually just finished a, a new article where I have a pretty strong critique against the government for exactly being where you are suggesting, not doing a lot, being behind, lagging in what they, what you know, the Federal Trade Commission and um, the president's policy teams and various agencies are doing in terms of figuring out what is good AI, um, how to automate, both how to automate themselves, their own services, um, but also having more of a leadership role in saying what are best practices, what are things that uh, can be done, should be done, how to scale the most promising, the, the most trustworthy AI. Um, what we really see these days is more of this protective stance of this is both true, by the way, in California, at the federal level, um, here in the United States, and also um, at the EU level, where the kind of the discourse about AI and also the, the policies that we see focus more on um, let's safeguard against biases, let's safeguard against too much automation, so let's keep a human decision maker, let's make sure that, you know, we're not completely automating, um, and let's safeguard against privacy. Those are probably the top three, uh, you know, privacy, human in the loop, and anti-discrimination um, kind of checks. Um, but there's so much more that can be done. So, you know, I think that government can really play an active role, a proactive role of investigating what are um, you know, the technologies right now on the market that are the safest uh, in terms of um, truth in reporting, you know, uh, getting, going after misinformation, removing that. Um, what are the best practices in medicine and health, um, like uh, patient adherence to treatment. Um, you know, there's a lot of new AI that is offering that kind of thing, or wearables that are trying to create more well-being. And you know, the market is is so open, and and there's a lot of innovation that's happening, and that's all good. But we as consumers actually want some something more centralized that will tell us what what is good what is better um what is snake oil that we should really s steer away from and we don't have that right now so one lesson from this podcast that i've taken away is really about machine learning something you said i found just really hit me that if the machine is learning but it's not learning from a diverse set of individuals the machine will learn a new um, step forward that does not consider the needs of every person, only one subset. So I think that was really, that's really interesting. So um, I would like to get to know you a little bit better along with my audience. Are you ready for some rapid fire questions? Sure. All right, great. So the first question is a little funny. What did you eat for breakfast today? 
I do intermittent fasting, literally, so I start at noon. <laughs> every guest has been saying, I'm going to have to take this question out because like literally every guest is like, I didn't eat breakfast. Um, uh, what is your ideal vacation? Disconnecting from <laughs> my computer, but uh, I, you know, I travel so much for work for um, major cities around the world. So I feel like I've seen the world that way. But my ideal vacation, which I don't get as often, is going into nature and really spending the week hiking in beautiful places. If you could have lunch with anybody dead or alive, who would it be? Ah, so many options. Um, Probably some of my favorite authors. Um, So... Um, right now I'm really loving, um, the book Bewilderment, um, and suddenly I forget, uh, the name of the author, but it's kind of really touching me. So I, I love just chatting with authors in general. So Richard Rousseau, who won the Pulitzer, um, is another favorite. And I just, if I could have lunches with people that I could just choose, I would, um, have a list of all the my favorite books and have lunches with all of them what is your idea of perfect happiness uh being with my three daughters my labrador my english lab and my husband uh in a beautiful setting near the water and just being grateful for health and family and friends. <laughs> if you had $1 billion, what would you do with it first? Uh, so much to do with a billion dollars. But in terms of causes that I um, am very much invested in, um, type 1 diabetes is probably my number one. I um, I start The Equality Machine, my new book, with a line I have three girls, the middle one is bionic, so my middle daughter has type 1 diabetes and she has really been benefiting from AI and medical devices that use digital technology and data uh, in a closed loop system of insulin pump plus glucose monitor. So that's, you know, all of these amazing, I have a whole chapter about health and all these amazing uh, innovations and advancement. Uh, and I would really invest in that. What is one tool or resource that you picked up during COVID that you still use today? I don't know if I picked it up during COVID, but I think I've become more efficient in having these meetings, uh, you know, remote and doing a lot of things remote. Um, and having just, you know, kind of connections, FaceTime, um, without having to travel so far and uh, enlarge our, um, you know, our our, uh, carbon footprint. Um, So, yeah, I guess digital communication in general, I I think we're perfecting. And sometimes it's to our detriment because I do still very much like the face-to-face, but there's a lot of good that can happen just staying in touch with people and seeing their faces even when uh, they're, you know, an ocean away. Orly, if people want to learn more about you or buy your new book, The Equality Machine, where can they do that? So The Equality Machine is available anywhere you buy your books, um, on Amazon, your favorite bookstore, um, on the website of Public Affairs, my publisher. There's also a list of um, the book tour that's already scheduled. So I'll be in Boston and Seattle and um, in Philadelphia and um, Los Angeles and San Diego, a lot of different places. And I would love to connect. I I always so love connecting with readers. Um, I'm very easy to find Orly Lobel on social media. So I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn and um, you can connect with me. And um, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing conversation. It's very exciting times. 
Orly, well, thank you so much for joining the Modern Customer Podcast. Everybody pick up a copy of The Equality Machine today. Until next time, this is the Modern Customer.